as uh, Kurds in Iran. Um, but it would be really nice to talk about Kurds in Iraq. Um, so currently, uh, Kurdistan, Iraqi Kurdistan, in better commerce, is taking 17% of the Iraqi national oil income, and they actually want to increase that to 20%. Um, they don't actually give anything back to Iraq for that. Um, also, if you wanted to go and work in Erbil, you would need a sponsor as an Iraqi um, to go and work there, which leaves me with the question of it doesn't really make much sense as an Iraqi national why you would need a sponsor. Um, so, I mean, what I can deduce from this situation, and I'm being very honest, but I think honesty is key, um, you know, in terms of the Iraqi situation with the Kurds, um, it's almost the narratives become um, kind of into the melting pot of all geopolitical issues in the region. And I feel like the Kurds have jumped on a bit of a political bandwagon of chaos to be like, well, you know, this is our oil, you know, Kirkuk, we're going to take this. Um, now we want 20%. We're in Iran. Also, we're pushing our factions in Iran and we're trying to create um, an environment for us which is more fair and, and, and more right. Um, so for me, can you just confirm from your perspective what the uh, agenda is from Iraqi Kurdistan um, and is the motivation um, self-obsessed or is it something that they feel can actually contribute to Iraqi society becoming something which is secular um, and actually contributing to the removal of ISIS um, and obviously the, the removal of Iran from the entire region because the concern is that the Kurds in Iran is encouraging the Iranian agenda and ethnic cleansing to spread. Thank I'm going to put the Kurdish view forward. Um, uh, the Kurdish view is that they, for for many years, they haven't actually got paid that 17% of the money which was supposed to be given to them but wasn't given. So they feel they are the victims here. And they feel that the Kurds have done everything that was asked for, from them, but in return wasn't uh, given what they need, what they want, or what is rightfully theirs. Um, and the reason is because of the system in Baghdad isn't very productive. With uh, Maliki, was it? Then, it, yeah, the previous, previous, uh, he marginalized Kurds. So the Kurds, I think, by and large, they, they know that right now they can't have a free Kurdistan. Uh, but the population, sort of the popular view, the popular belief is that they, they want to be an independent state. They don't want to remain part of Iraq. They are part of Iraq because America made them uh, in 2003. And uh, the long-term aim is to uh, to separate, but that needs to happen in a legal way. And what's so your assessment of that? <laughs> you, you gave us the Kurdish term. What's your assessment? I think the in the long run, it, it, for, for me, it, it's what the, the people in Kurdistan region want to be free, and I think they should have a choice about that. Uh, but in the long run, uh, right now, I don't think it's a good idea because Turkey and Iran are going to use all their influence to stifle it, to to weaken the Kurds. And I think in the long run, when things are much better, uh, when the ISIS threat is dealt with, when uh, Iraq is more willing to to sort of, if Iraq doesn't give what the Kurds want, then the Kurds should have a right to pursue freedom. Let's see the point. Thank you. I mean, you have your question covers quite a lot of uh, aspects. So we'll start with the 17%. That was not forced on the Iraqi government. The Iraqi government accepted that in 2003, 2004, 5, 6, 7. So it's there. As for the revenues, and whether Kurds or Kurdistan, the KRG, gives back anything, oil, etc. Yes, they have been doing that for some time. And then, uh, as my friend here, Jenkins, um, mentioned that they never received that share. 
for a good reason. But that disputes this per percentage, saying that, well, you, yes, it's yours, you have 17%, but also you owe the government revenues from the border entries, uh, Ibrahim Khalil, etc., etc. So the money issue is not really, it's not like um, the KRG is forcing the hand of Baghdad and just taking that money by force. There are issues, very complicated issues related to that. As um, for the sponsor, uh, I think that has been cancelled now, and the main reason was, at least they declared the official one, was security. It's not about anything else, it's about security. But yes, it's unfair and it should be um, uh, addressed. And I think it has been, um, to the best of my knowledge. My family lives in Arabia, so <coughs> I know a bit. Um, did they take advantage of the chaos in the Middle East and the geopolitical change? And the yes, and they are very proud of it. And they're not denying it. Actually, they wish that Turkey will become weak as well, and the Iran as well. And this is the where they get their chance to rise and get you know to realize their state. Would they? Would that be? Um, unethical, it's politics. And the greater Kurdistan, as they, as most of the Kurds recognize, is there, it's on the map. But they're very pragmatic, and they have been coexisting with everybody else in the Middle East, and they're willing to do that, and they have been doing that. And even today, I think, um, out of my meetings with senior Kurdish uh, officials, I think they want to coexist with Baghdad, but in this state where they have as much power as they could, if not, then it's not. I disagree with my friend here, Cengiz, that in the future when things are better, Kurdistan actually might get independence. When things get better and Baghdad is strong and the central government in Syria is strong as well, the Kurdish dream of an independent state would be very far. Let me just give you, I'm, I'm not claiming to be a Kurdish issue expert. But let me just, in terms of the facts, when the oil for food program was made during the sanctions regime, the oil for food program was deducting 17% from the oil and giving it to Kurdistan. So it's not 2003. We're talking about 1995, I think, or six. This is number one. Number two, the constitution, which was produced by the Americans, is a trouble-making constitution. In the first instance, when you look at the oil, everywhere in the world, if you have a federal government, oil issues and policy matters, the federal authority has the last word. In the Iraqi constitution, if there is a dispute between the region and the federal government, then the region uh, supersedes the federal government. So you have a problem on the oil exploitation in Iraq at the present moment because the KRG is uh, signing contracts and uh, concessions and oil deals and what have you with the companies without the approval of the government. Indeed, even the government in Baghdad is not following the constitution itself. As far as the entry into and, and uh, you know, if you if you are a a person from Fallujah and you can't even enter the capital of your country, you can understand why you cannot enter into Kurdistan. But to go back again to the issue of the relationship, at the present moment, the government in Baghdad, quote unquote, the Shiite line, is trying to say, we are not going to allow the Kurds to become a state. So they have this idea, the concept of the disputed regions. You have a on the other hand, the Sunnis, because they are seeking sanctuaries in Kurdistan and because they are, to a certain degree, against the government, so you get two of them against the, the government in Baghdad. So the picture is mutilated, actually. But the facts of the wishes of the Kurdish people to have their own state, I think it's a, it's a thing which doesn't disappear. It's what people want. Uh, whether they can have it or not is another matter, and it's only the future which will write. Now, I think I wanted to ask a question. Sorry, and then. about the role of arts. I mean, you know, there are musicians, there are film production, 
Thank you very much. Um, yes, there is no clear answer, unfortunately, on that because there are, to the best of my knowledge, there aren't many studies on this topic. How far Kurds are integrated into the Iranian society in different aspects of life. But generally, um, Kurds speak Sorani Kurdish dialect in, in uh, Kurdistan of Iran. And uh, they speak also, the, most of them, all of them are, bi most of them, not all, most of them are bilingual. So they speak Persian language, Kurdish language as well. They, uh, the schools, um, I think, um, s mostly are taught in Persian, but there are some schools, I think, in Iran and Kurdish. I'm not quite sure about that, if this is, and Kermanji as well, because Iran is um, like, like Iraq during the 70s, I think, um, during the, the 70s um, in Iraq, Kurdish language was taught, and also there were schools in, in Kurdish language. So Iran is a bit more advanced in this regard than Iraq and Turkey, and that, that plays uh, a role. Um, in terms of services, that's also another aspect maybe you didn't mention. Uh, it, there is no discrimination against Kurds in Iran when it comes to services, electricity, these kind of basic things. In, in other countries, Kurds complain that the Kurd central government or their central governments discriminate against them. And I would take a, an example in Syria. During Assad time, he's still in power. Um, um, many Kurds, they were without identity. Still today, no passports. And, but in Iran, that's not the case. Um, in terms of arts, Kurds, they have their own distinct culture. However, they share some things with the Iranians and the, you know, um, Zertashti um, um, religion, some of the cultural um, festivals um, they share, for example, on the Nowruz um, and the date of the Nowruz. Maybe the story about around it differs a bit, but it's generally uh, the same. So yeah, there is this aspect of integration and, and po commentators and uh, experts, when they mention that, they're not completely wrong. Yes, there is some aspect of integration. Uh, just to add a little to that, uh, in Iran they say the Kurds are the true Iranians and they, there is a kind of a recognition of identity but uh, when, you, when you try to demand I want education for my children in Kurdish, they will not allow that. They do provide some education but it's like an additional course, uh, like a le lesson for the children. It has not accepted or accommodated the national demands of the Kurds. And you mentioned uh, films and music. Uh, some of the most famous uh, Iranian musicians are actually Kurdish. There's Shahram Nasseri, and there's Bahman Gobadi. Yeah, uh, it, culturally they are integrated, but politically they are very much discriminated against. And Concerning the political parties, the KDPI and KDP in Iraq, kind of sister parties, <laughs> uh, they do support each other, but the history is much more complicated. Uh, K when Kurdish, the KDPI and when Kurdish movement in Ira Iran was based in Iraq, uh, Iran was supporting the Kurds in Iraq. As a condition, uh, that meant Kurds, Kurdish movement in Iran, sorry, Kurdish movement in Iraq kind of discouraged the development of Kurdish movement in Iran. So in a way they were suppressing the Kurds and I mentioned the case uh, in 19, late 1960s there was an insurgency by a group of KDPI people. Uh, the Barzan is actually involved in uh, suppression of that. They obviously had to do it because Iran was demanding, and if Iran, if they didn't do it, Iran would withdraw their support. There is also that kind of context, but uh, it's a complicated issue. And thank you, thank yes. you for your question. Well, it's, um, most of the Kurds in, in, Ira in northern Iraq um, or in the KRG. Uh, they are Sunnis. The vast majority, they are Sunnis, but there are some Shia, and there are also s some secular, and, and they are a sizable uh, number. And that's why the KRG itself is, um, a, the, its political thought is not Islamic. It's anything but, actually. 
Islamic and its roots goes back to probably the ex-Soviet Union. Do they identify themselves? Some are. The Islamists actually call themselves Sunnis. And um, a good example is the um, uh, Paradali, the, the head, um, the, the president of the uh, Islamic Association of Scholars, I think. Um, so he's a Kurd from Iraq, and he's a Sunni. And if you if you follow him on Twitter, and you, you yeah, yeah. Ali Qaradari. If, if you follow him on Twitter and you see his rhetoric, he's actually, he, he hardly mentions that he's a Kurd. He's always talking as a Sunni, he's def he defends Sunnis, he's critical of the Hashid militias, etc. So yes, there are, there are some Kurds who are very much, as, as they, they identify themselves as Sunnis, and also some are um, a, a pro a, a Salafist, um, like the um, small group in, in Halabja. Do they associate themselves with the Sunnis in Iraq and in the other parts, you know, Arabs? That's a different story. It's, it's, a, it's a quite controversial, and even inside Kurdistan, I think um, they have this debate every now and again. So generally, I think, yes, they identify themselves, but they are, those who identify themselves are not big enough to make any change inside the KRG. As for the um, PKK presence in northern Iraq, Officially, the PKK exists only in the Kandil Mountains, and it's, it was um, part of a secret, sort of secret political deal between Baghdad, with the approval of Baghdad. And that's very important to mention that it's not the KRG that brought them in without the approval of Baghdad. Now, during Maliki term, um, the Baghdad government accepted that PKK comes to Kandil Mountains, but now Baghdad is very weak after uh, the, the fall of Mosul and the rise of ISIS. Um, the PKK has around approximately around 5,000 fighters uh, near the Azidi areas, and also they have some in in, um, near, in Kirkuk or in southern Kirkuk, and they are part of the now not only of the um, um, political rhetoric, but also they are a militant group, a sizable militant group, and they are supposedly defending uh, Kurds. Uh, this would definitely um, um, ignite tensions and with, with Turkmen, and the Turkmen tensions with the Kurds are not only with the PKK, it, there is history there and goes back decades. I think um, it will stay for some time, and I think the PKK would also clash with the KRG, you know, only with the, um, with the Turkmen. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, the political parties are based in mainly Iraqi Kurdistan, and although they do represent Kurds in Iran, or they, and uh, there's also military forces of these political parties based on the Iran-Iraq border, but uh, sort of in the Ira Iraqi side. Uh, in Iran, if they catch you as a, if you're a political activist openly debating Kurdish rights, you will get into trouble. So it's not as free as that. Is a is a very suppressive regime. Culturally, it tolerates Kurdish presence, but politically, it's strictly against it. And uh, the point you mentioned about the literature, I I don't know. It's the first time I heard from you. Uh, but the reason there are much research done about Kurds in Iran is because of the suppression. Iran. It's very difficult, Mohanad has mentioned, it's very difficult to go to Iran as a researcher and carry out like ethnographic research and things like that. Uh, so we have researchers who are based outside and they write about Kurdish affairs in Iran, but it's not as rich as literature as other parts. Well, thank you very much. I know there are some questions, but unfortunately we're running out of time. Uh, I would like to make a couple of comments as a closing uh, thing. First of all, I was criticized for not making it clear that what I've said at the beginning is different from what I said at the end in my uh, starting point because it gave the impression as if the, what I have said about the history and all the other things is FRBI position. That was my position, not because FRBI is an independent uh, thing. Second thing I think we have discussed today, two main components 
of the problems in Iraq, Syria, and Iran. And that is Shiaism and Kurdism, if you like. Uh, we haven't discussed the state actors uh, sufficiently. Uh, the uh, issue of the other uh, uh, non-state actors, like the militias and what have you, we refer to them in general terms, but I think we've discussed, we have not discussed them sufficiently. Uh, we are grateful for your presence. We are thankful for your questions and your, for your involvement. Uh, I hope you will uh, come out of this one with a little more, at least if, if one got one snippet of information which one did not know before, that would be something good. I think in the university, people sometimes attend a lecture and they go out and they haven't benefited one thing. Uh, thank you very much, all of you, and hope to see you again. Thank you.